And we're live, everybody. Good morning. It is Friday. Wow. December 3rd. Hopefully you've already started your Christmas shopping. It's on the way, guys. Tick, tick, tick. <laughs> My name is Brian Armitrout with the Food Leadership Group, Food Safety Foundation. And of course, if you're here, this is the Food Safety Chat Live. And we do this every Friday and we go live on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And we talk about all things food safety. And I have the privilege of bringing on guests here on the show with me to talk about topics around food safety. And today I have my good friend, Austin Welsh. She's with me today. Austin, good morning. Good morning. How's it going, man? Going well. So everybody, what's really cool and unique about this, if you're new to this, first off, welcome. And this is not, this is not a presentation. This is not us lecturing you on a particular topic. This is us sharing information and things that we've learned and stuff that we find that's really cool that can help you in your career. And the advantage of this is it's interactive. You get to ask us questions. We'll respond to those questions and kind of weave them into the conversation here over the next 45 minutes. And uh, it's always amazing to me because every single time we do this, time goes like this. And um, <laughs> before we got in the air here, uh, us and I were having a bit of a philosophical conversation about life and collecting stuff and what happens when you're gone and all these type of things. And, and we're, you know, it's like we kind of ended just before we went on the air here of, you know, it's like, well, and then, you know, we're all dead. It's like, oh, geez, you know, this is going <laughs> to make for a tough food safety chat here. But we're all here. We're all grateful to be here. We're going to have an awesome chat. We're all so, alive. Yep. And. We're here in Colorado. Austin's in Colorado as well. And the weather here has been absolutely gorgeous and amazing. I mean, yesterday was a record high. What, 73, 74, something crazy? Yeah, it's like insane. That. Yeah. And um, weekend's supposed to be looking nice as well. You look out the window, beautiful skies. It's a good time to be in Colorado, that's for sure. Unless you own a ski resort and they're not too happy. <laughs> But that's okay. So, uh, Catherine, good to see you this morning. Uh, Duncan, good morning to you. Uh, Renee, my assistant is here. So thank you for joining us, Renee. Tim, nice to see you again. Hopefully the weather in Minneapolis is nice. Uh, Tammy, nice to see your happy face again this morning. Austin, uh, Yasmin, nice to see you from Toronto. Uh, Martin, always good to see Martin here as well. Uh, we always have such an amazing uh, group of people who join us on this. So thank you because we do this for you. And we're really happy when we have this interaction. So uh, glad to have us. Now, one of the things, Austin, that I always forget, and I just about did it here right now, is one of the rituals we have here in the morning is we like to everybody have a, a drink of your favorite beverage together with us. So I have coffee. Looks like Austin's got his as well. So please join us. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, good morning, David from DC. Wonderful. Hey, David. Good place to be there as well, David. In DC, DC is a nice place. I always like going there, except for in the middle of the summer. Super hot. Uh, Lance is uh, in Northern Cal, always a nice place. I worked in the dairy industry for a long time, so I spent my fair share in Northern California out in the valley. That is for sure. Um, so one of the things before we get started here as well, I wanted to acknowledge my sponsor. Let's see if I can do this right here today. Hey, look at that. I did it. Okay. Up here in the corner, we've got uh, EAS Consulting Group is a uh, group of consultants who are working out of the DC area. Everybody is independent contractors like myself. I work with EAS and they have in the food space over 100 consultants in their stable of talent that they can call upon. So odds are, if you have something that you're working on and you're trying to kind of take your programs and systems to that next level, get ready for SQF version nine or whatever it is you're doing, they're going to have somebody who can help you with that. On average, Austin, they have over 20 years of experience across the entire board for everybody working for EAS, which is absolutely amazing. And as part of the sponsorship with EAS, one of the things that they graciously allow is a discount for those training programs that they have. So you can go and peruse their training programs, get 15% off uh, using code word Brian when you check out. So that's Brian with a Y, B-R-Y-A-N. I don't think it's case sensitive, so you should be okay there. But you get 15% off that training, so you can do in-person trainings, come in and do some uh, customized training for your teams. You can also uh, do some of the trainings that they have online, which is great during this COVID time. And of course, that uh, segues really nicely into our topic today, which is training. So that's a, that's a good segue there. Uh, good morning, Pedro. Nice to see you here as well. Now we've had Austin on before and the response we had from what we talked about relative to training was absolutely amazing. So we're really happy to have Austin back here. I think 
what Sage Media and his company is doing is absolutely cutting edge. So um, for people who are new to the show, Austin, let's kind of give everybody an idea of what it is that your company does and what you do. Certainly. Thanks, man. Um, so, yeah, I uh, created Sage Media with my uh, business partner, Richard Fleming, um, about seven or eight years ago now. And the kind of the catalyst for it was that we both came from a, a background in working in production and happened to uh, stumble our way into the leadership development world and saw the training films that that people had and were really kind of appalled um, at the, the lack of storytelling, the lack of emotional engagement, the lack of cinematography, um, and decided that this was an industry that we really wanted to get into. And the, the kind of the, the best way that I sum up what Sage Media does, um, because we are both filmmakers, learning designers, and researchers. So we kind of created this Venn diagram and in the middle is that Sage Media. And it's a combination of, you know, learning design in one circle, um, storytelling and filmmaking in another, and then cognitive science in the third. Uh, so, um, so we're leveraging a lot of research from cognitive science, which is everything from motivational theory to neuroscience, to psychology, sociology, down to what we were talking about earlier, philosophy. Um, you know, finding meaning in life and how that applies to our work and how do we translate that into learning. Mm. So the, the goal is really to to transcend learning from just like knowledge transfer to, you know, how does this actually tie into the mission and the values and the ethics and, you know, the, the, the deeper meaning to what it is that we do in the food industry. Yeah. And and that's why this is so fascinating, right? So training is super, super important. And we're seeing lots of content and lots of people out there talking about food safety culture. What does that mean? How do you measure it? What do auditors do when they come in? And a lot of times you hear comments back along the lines of it's like uh, art appreciation. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what good art is, but I know what I like. And a lot of times with auditors, that's kind of the way it is, too. They'll have little things they'll look at in plants around food safety culture. Um, so, for example, if during the opening meeting, the only people who show up for the opening meeting is the quality manager and the auditor and nobody else is available, right? it sends a strong message. If during the closing meeting, it's a repeat of that, right? It's, it's the quality manager and the auditor and the plant manager comes in for a few minutes and the first thing out of his mouth is, what's my score? Right? So <laughs> that's yeah. a bad sign too, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was on the SQF Technical Advisory Council, this is a subject we talked about all the time is... This was 2.1 under SQF management commitment and these type of things was one of the least written up things because it's very hard to quantify and put yourself in the shoes of the auditor. I mean, you're sitting in a meeting with this plant and you've just gone through and done this audit and looked at all their systems and checked all these things. And then during the closeout meeting, you write them up for lack of management commitment and a insufficient food safety culture. It's not going to sit too well, right? Um, because they're going to push back because nobody likes to be told you suck. And <laughs> essentially that's what you're doing. And that puts the auditors in a very awkward, awkward spot because it's hard, it's hard to defend. And we're all running around Austin trying to figure out what food safety culture means. And this kind of goes back to me for that artwork analogy. Um, we can do what we did in the past, which I've done plenty of, and it's terrible, right? A, there's a PowerPoint that's created on a subject. And normally it's, you know, the team at corporate or whatever, they'll put together a PowerPoint presentation on, oh, geez, I don't know, GMPs. And it'll be a deck of 20 or 30 slides. And it's got all kinds of words on the pages and quotes from the CFR and pictures of things you shouldn't be doing, et cetera, et cetera. And then that goes out to the organization. And the command come down, comes down to the plants that, hey, you guys need to train everybody in your plant every year on this, rah, 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 right? And what happens then is it generally gets thrown on the quality manager's shoulders and they're like, oh, right? And so they're like, all right, fine. We need to get through the training. And they get everybody in a training room and the quality manager stands up the front and she's like, hey guys, we got to do our GMP training. And either... Consciously or subconsciously, she's putting the message forward that, all right, let's just get through this. All right, you don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Man. And it normally happens at the end of a shift. Right? So let's, let's say that overnight you have sanitation. 
And that sanitation crew has been cleaning all night and they're wet and they're tired and they're dirty. And now you put them in a conference room and they're sitting in the back of the classroom, Austin. Eh, they're, they're all like this, right? They're barely conscious and they're looking at their phones and they're like, whatever, right? And so the quality manager reads through the slides, clicks through them, tries maybe to get some engagement with people and ask them questions. And at the end, everybody gets a written quiz and everybody goes, oh, thank God. And they all go their own way. The follow-up on that is that there's always people that miss, right? And there's people on vacation. And now the quality manager's got to track them down and do training for them. And everybody walks away going, oh, my God. Right? One thing I think we can all agree on, Austin, is that's not how to do it, right? If you want to build a food safety culture, training is critical, absolutely critical. And you have to be able to convey this information. And I think what's going on right now is everybody understands with this particular topic around food safety culture that we need to do something. But the story I just told is the only tool we have, right? And it's not going to work. Um, so it gets down to that learning design piece, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's kind of dive into that, that topic around that is... So how is learning how is learning designed? What is it that you found in your business? Yeah, well, and I think what you know, the, the first thing you were talking about there is developing a culture of learning. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we talk about, you know, food safety culture, I think the culture of learning is, is really important. Um, and I'm at, uh, about to actually publish an article on this around like, you know, kind of how to assess your existing you know, culture of learning around food safety culture. How, how does this integrate into your overall strategy? But I think a lot of times what you're talking about is that the 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 training or the education programs are rolled out as a, it's a, you know, twofold. It's either we got to meet compliance, right? We got to check this box um, or there's a knee jerk reaction to something happened and, and, that isn't correct. And obviously we need to do training again because our people don't understand how to do something properly. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest thing that the biggest opportunity that I see a lot of people miss is just taking a, a taking a beat and, and asking themselves the larger question of why are we doing this in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, begin with the end in mind. And so as a as a learning designer whenever you know i come in to to work with the client consult with them you know they usually will say well we want to develop a food safety culture program and and that's kind of where the, the where the conversation just kind of stops and they're like and what do you think and it's like okay well let's <laughs> let's uncover what that means to you um and but and to do that you know as and when i put on that learning designer hat there's four main things that i'm looking at and the, the, the first one I'm looking at is what is the actual result that you want as a company? Why are we doing this in the first place? What is the return on investment? What is the K KPI, right? Because like you said, rolling out the GMP training without specific KPIs, it's just nebulous training um, that just floats around in, in my head. Um, so actually naming the, the, the specifics of what you want to see happen makes it easier to move on to that next step, which is what behavior is necessary to drive that KPI. So once again, if we're looking at things, you know, hand washing, right? Um, we know that we wanna lower recalls due to, you know, potential issues that were attributed to hand washing. Um, that's the, you know, the KPI might be lower, you know, by X amount. Um, the behavior that we're looking at is, well, you know, we need people to wash their hands. Well, the, the question then is why, are, why aren't they? So it's doing that analysis of why is this behavior not happening? And, and a lot of times it might be, it's not knowledge-based, it's environmental, right? The, the hand washing, there's not enough hand washing stations. They're in odd places where it's hard to get to um, in time. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, they're out of sight, out of mind. And so they're, they're I mean, so they're, they're, that's where, you know, as consultants, we also look at, you know, what are, what are the other potential risk factors that are preventing this, this behavior? Um, but once we, but if it is a behavioral thing, then we go, okay, well, what knowledge is lacking? So we're kind of moving in this specific order, right? We're, we're saying, what do we want to see happen? 
what behavior is necessary to make that happen than what knowledge is necessary to drive that behavior. So, okay, well, they, they don't under, you know, maybe they don't know what 20 seconds looks like, what 30 seconds looks like in the real world or um, the, the proper hand washing procedure. They're, they're missing parts of the hand or something like that. So, so then we design the knowledge aspect of it. Here's what they need to know. And then the final aspect, which is usually where most people start, is then, then we say, well, how do we create a training environment that will foster the, the facilitation of that knowledge? Um, and that's things like you were talking about, making sure that, um, that the company is placing a certain level of importance on the training, right? Do they have a clean room to do this in? Is it comfortable? Is it, is it planned at, at the appropriate time? Or is it just being shoehorned in, sending the mm -hmm. message that, you know, this is just something we got to get off our plate to, you know, satisfy legal, and we, we then move on with our lives. Um, so create, setting that tone is really important. And then those are the, you know, the four main aspects that, that I look at within learning design, which is what's the final result I want? What's the behavior that I'm looking for? What's the knowledge that I want to bestow upon somebody, the new information? And then what's the, what's the training environment look like? How am I going to do that? And for me personally in, in Sage Media, most of our training environment focuses on storytelling and narrative films where we create these stories to connect emotionally so that people will pay attention. We, we want to drive curiosity and engagement so that they will actively engage in the learning. We tap into some motivation and then hopefully drive that behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point because the storytelling piece of it is so important because when we're at home and right, we were talking about some shows on Netflix and Hulu before we went live here as well. We, we come home after a hard day at work and we choose with our free time to watch stories. Mm -hmm. We get involved, right? My wife and I are watching Vikings on, on Hulu and you have these characters and you follow them and they have trials and tribulations and they try and for the case of the Vikings where everybody dies, right? Everybody back then dies, you know, they drop like flies. And, you know, if you're like make to 30, you're like, yes. And um, you, engage in stories right I'm, I'm not watching a book on vikings of well vikings were in the 800s in the scandinavian countries and they went on raiding and pillaging missions <sighs> okay yeah was is there a quiz at the end here or what um <laughs> no you're in you're involved in the story right and that storytelling element is so so important right it gets back to those elements gmps right so i that's a perfect example of what we were talking about here what result do we want right we want and let's say that we have a, a product where, where the people are, are, you know, moving products and touching things and stuff like this. We want to make sure that we're reducing our micro load. Maybe that's a good thing to measure in that product, right? So we were at this benchmark level for micro and QC testing for product. Let's bring that down by 50%. Okay, now what are we then going to, what behavior are we going to change? Well, let's take a look at the hand washing. We assume, I think Austin, you made a good point on that. We assume that the hand washing station itself is great, right? Okay, well, let's go watch because shifts arrive in groups. And if you've got 20 people backed up waiting for the hand wash station, some people are going to be like, ah, I got to clock in. I don't have time for this, right? And they're going to bypass it. Um, something we found out in the dairy industry a number of years ago is there's a particular design of a hand washing station. It's one of these circular ones where everybody can kind of stand around it good in theory right because you can get lots of people washing their hands but we found that the mechanism inside would get dirty and if you didn't take it apart and clean it periodically that that hand washing station was spreading germs it wasn't fixing them and yeah. so you need to look at your hand wash station right is, is this providing the function i mean and there, there's new tools that are out there right with things you can stick your hands in and they you know time and stuff like that awesome but if you've got people backed up and they bypass it what's the point you also have to remember that people who are doing the GMP training aren't microbiologists, right? A lot of times in plants, people will say, oh, no, I wear gloves. My hands are good. They just assume that the gloves are sterile. And you have to understand that and teach it in those terms. Um, and the environment. Oh, my God. Yeah, the environment. Normally, the training room in plants is the dungeon, right? It's, it's somewhere <laughs> off to the side. It's full of folding metal chairs. You know, they get together there for birthdays every now and then. And it's just a dank, dingy, awful space, right? Who wants to learn in that? Well, and, and you know, and, and talking about the storytelling thing, you know, the people choose, they go home and, and they'll binge, you know, Netflix shows and Hulu shows and things like that. And the thing is, is that 
you're still learning in that. I mean, storytelling at its core is a educational thing. You learn something at the end of, of anything that you are watching. That's the that's when we talk about the moral of the story is that if you don't have a story with a strong moral, then you, it's boring and you're not learning anything. And yeah. so one of the you know analogies I use a lot is that, you know, when I was watching Mad Men, you know, I was fascinated with the show and I was like, I was learning something. So there's not a curriculum attached to it, but I could easily create a curriculum based yeah. on each episode of Mad Men where it's like, okay, well, in this episode, <clears throat> we learned about how to acquire new clients. We learned about sexual harassment and alcoholism, <laughs> you know, and, you know, but each one of those things, I mean, I could, I could literally create a curriculum for, you know, um, you know, a, a, a um, sobriety course on like, here are the key signs of, of alcoholic behavior, right? And here's what we can see. But then, but because you are consuming that information in a story world, there's something magical that happens where you synthesize that information into your own world. And what we see a lot within training is that it's so on the nose, right? It's so didactic that it's, it becomes so sterile that I, I can't apply it to my own reality. But if we make it a little bit more complicated, and I don't mean like overly complicated, but, but in a story, whenever you're watching a movie, you're usually thinking, what's going to happen next? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have the answer, but I want to know what that answer will be. Therefore, I will keep watching. That's the kind of complexity that we want to include into training, because that curiosity drives that intrinsic motivation. I want to know what this is, as opposed to I'm being forced to learn this. God, that is, that is, yeah, that is so smart because yeah, for example, with the Viking show, I now know that Ragnar Lothbrook was, was a Viking raider and a king in Norway. And you go on, I look, I looked all this stuff up online. He was a real historical figure. Now, of mm -hmm. course, it's a story, right? And they're taking liberty with it. They don't know everything about him. But I know his name was Ragnar and he had a wife, Lagatha, and he had five kids, Uba, Hitzberg, you know, and I know all this crap, right? I'm learning history from the Vikings mm -hmm. that I didn't know before I watched this show. And it, it wasn't set up as a PowerPoint. It was a story and it's an engaging story. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, unfortunately we didn't get this contract, but, you know, we pitched an idea for a sales training to a large, you know, sales organization. Um, they, they wanted to, you know, create this customer centric sales journey. And it was really about, you know, specifically be to, you know, like manufacturing sales. And we said, you know, look, you know, the best way to convey this, I think would be, we should create kind of a, a story that mimics SpaceX and, and oh. like, you know, a story about someone trying to go to the Mars and, you know, but also all of the, all of the interactions and the moving parts that are necessary to make that happen, you know, um, because that's where we get, so now we have a common mission that we can look at. This wasn't for a SpaceX company, they were a sales company, but it was like, but how do we create a story that is analogous enough where, where the, the learner needs to make that connection themselves? Because what we see too often is that, learning is designed in this way where it's like we want to make sure that they get a hundred percent each time we want we just need to, to to get this checked off and it's like but that's not you're not learning anything you have yeah. to struggle is inherent in learning you, as you create those new neural connections it's hard that's that's what learning looks like so we want to make sure that it's that we're actually engaging them in something that that requires a little bit of that struggle and that's where that storytelling comes in because you're kind of you know um putting sugar in the medicine where it's like, okay, I'll, I'll engage in this because I'm curious to find out where this goes. Well, that, that goes back to good storytelling, right? The hero's journey, the hero has to go through some type of change and struggle and come out better at the end. And exactly. We, we care about that. Um, David had a question here for us. Is there an equivalent of food safety culture in other industries that has been successful? Mm, good question. So I'm not sure I totally understand the question, David, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, if you want to elaborate while I try to fumble my way through this, please do so. Um, equivalent of food safety culture in other industries. So I'm thinking of like, I, th I think of safety culture in, 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 is the first place I go to. So I think, and Brian, you and I were talking about this just yesterday, uh, Alcoa Aluminum was a, uh, a company, there was a gentleman named Paul O'Neill who came into 
Alcoa, I think it was back in the 80s. And Alcoa was a huge steel or um, aluminum manufacturing company. Uh, profits were down. They weren't, they didn't have, they actually had a really good safety record, but they still had injuries. They still had fatalities. It's a, it's a dangerous in industry. And this gentleman, Paul O'Neill came into Alcoa to, you know, the CEO to hopefully, you know, get the, get the profits back up because they were struggling financially. And at, at the first shareholder meeting, he said, essentially, if you want to see how Alcoa is doing financially, you need to look at our safety record. And, and this man, took this very seriously and drove that culture where it was like, if there's an incident in any of our factories around the world, here's my cell phone. I want the plant manager or whoever is in charge to call me directly and let me know what happened. We're going to investigate it. We're going to find out what's going on. They were driving for, I think it was the concept was, you know, they called it like better than zero or below zero. So basically they were like, we want people to go home better at the end of the day than when they came in. So that's, you know, that, that, that we don't want to just like not have incidents. We want people to be refreshed and regenerized, you know, and feel good about the work that they're doing when they go home. And as a result, over a 10, 15 year uh, process, this, not only did they get the best safety rating or, you know, best safety scores in, in the industry, I mean, profits went up like 400%. Like he, he pulled that company out of the hole because they had a common mission to stand behind now. You know, when, so when we talk about the moral of the story, the moral of the story resoundingly was we are a safe place to work, which meant recruitment was easier. Retaining people was easier. Um, you know, the less safety issues, less money spent. Um, so hopefully, uh, David, that might answer what you were asking. I'm actually looking at the comments now. No, I think that's good, right? Because one, one of the things that they do well in safety is the concept of near misses. Right? So a forklift goes around a corner too fast and almost hits somebody. Woo, shoot, right? Everybody kind of goes like this, but they actually investigate that because on the, on the safety side of things, near misses lead to accidents, right? So if we can prevent the near misses, we're going to prevent the accidents. So that's good thinking on that side. Yeah, um, and Jill has a great comment here yeah. about the car industry in Japan um, utilizing the, the Kaizen methodology. And that's that's a critical element to, you know, our consulting practice is, you know, going through uh, what's also been called the five whys. So asking why a particular issue is is you're, you're faced with um, is occurring and, and continue asking why. So going back to the hand washing issue, you know, people aren't washing their hands. Well, why aren't they washing their hands? Well, they don't have time to wash their hands. Well, why don't they have time to wash their hands? Well, it's because the, the, we don't have, you know, the, we don't have enough sinks. Well, why don't you have enough sinks? Well, the plant wasn't designed that way. Well, why, you know, and you keep going yeah. to find the root cause and it's like, okay, well now we can fix that. Um, as opposed to just making these assumptions as to what the problem might be. Yeah, as opposed to, yeah, going down the floor and yelling at everybody and saying, hey, wash your hands, right? And then, and then <laughs> right. Going back to your office and think you've, you've done your job when you really haven't. And I, I think really this, this kind of gets into, and really we've been talking about our, our step, second topic here for the um, conversation, which is why do people learn? You know, what motivates people to learn, right? It's not, and we were talking about this, right? It's not how do people learn at this point. It's like, why? Why do people choose to learn? Yeah. And that gets into, you know, whenever I was explaining at the beginning what Sage Media does, this gets into the cognitive science circle of that Venn diagram. And so, so much of the of what we're looking at is, is gathering research from academia and then trying to synthesize that into, you know, executable <laughs> strategies uh, back for the industry. And this was a topic that started with me years ago when I was looking into anti-harassment training. And I was like, well, A, why is it so hated? You know, nobody likes it. Why is it so bad? And also, why is it so ineffective? Um, statistically speaking, when you look at um, EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, that, which is the governmental entity that tracks and maintains sexual harassment mm -hmm. filings, you look year over year, and it's basically, it's round about 12,000 filings each year, give or take. Two, two or two percent up or down but it, i mean it is the definition of status quo even though for 30 years we have as a country been doing anti-harassment training 
so that was the big question was, well, we're doing the training, but it's not actually doing anything. It's not working. Well, what, why is that? And so, you know, I started looking into research. Um, there's a gentleman named Frank Dobbin from Harvard, and he does a lot of research around diversity uh, and inclusion training. And one of the big things he found was, is, you know, as soon as you start talking about the law, you start to lose people. Mm. Because now we're talking about an extrinsic motivator. We're talking about here is the punishment that will happen if you don't behave accordingly, um, in which we can get into our existing prison system and, and laws around, you know, we look at the, the war on drugs and, and how effective that was and things like that. Social, so there's a lot of social science that, that shows that, le- you know, u- utilizing these extrinsic motivators, which is either a punishment or a reward, to drive a behavior usually does not la- lead to a lasting change. Mm. But if we tap into intrinsic motivation, which is my internal drive to do something because I enjoy doing it just for the, the sheer fun of it or because it because it interests me, because I'm curious about it. Well, that is what you know drives people to want to learn. So the question that I'm constantly looking at is, well, how do I create the environment, the learning environment where someone feels compelled to learn, not where I'm forcing them to, but they, but they're like, yeah, this is something I want to engage in. And so the, you know, some great research from a a field of of motivational theory um, called self-determination theory. And, and this is probably the most cited uh, and, and widely accepted theory on motivation in the world. And what they found, what drives that intrinsic motivation is three key elements. It's a sense of autonomy. It's a sense of mastery or competence. Um, and it's a sense of relatedness. Mm-hmm. So people are more likely to want to engage in the training if they feel that they are autonomous in some way, right? That I have choice. I have volition. Um <clears throat> if they have a chance to practice the training, practice mastery, practice their competence, prove that they know what they're, they're doing, because all of us want to feel that we're great at what we do, regardless of what we do. And then the third one is, is trying to create a sense of relatedness. And when we talk about relatedness, it's, it's like relatedness to my team, relatedness to my, my manager, relatedness to the company mission, right? That, that I understand I'm not just making, you know, a uh, flavor additive. I'm like, I'm, we're creating a safe food for people to consume. So looking at it from a larger holistic viewpoint. Uh, yeah, an example of that that we were talking about before was um, we used to have a quality questionnaire we would insert in products and we would get back verbatims from our customers. And normally when you hear back from your customers and your consumers in the marketplace, it's complaints, right? <laughs> I bought this and I don't like it, right? Well, this was an amazing opportunity to tell people to tell us what they loved about our products. And they did it like crazy. And people would write in and say, oh, I love your product. And I eat it during the holidays and I feed it to my grandchildren. And it's part of our family tradition and these type of things. And we would get the results back from these surveys once a month. And I would post them on a bulletin board outside of the employee locker room. And people would line up to read those. And if I didn't post those on time, oh boy, did I hear it. It's people would be in my office saying, Brian, where's, where's, where's the, where's the customer feedback? Where's our, you know, we want to see. And it, it created that teamwork, right? Because people could see the outcome of their work and what they were doing mattered and they were making people happy. And it was amazing to see that. And that's awesome. You know, and I love that. And it, you know, so, but here's the tricky part, right? Is that all of this stuff, there, there's no panacea for any of these things because, Customer reviews can also be a double-edged sword. So my wife is a physician and once a month she gets an email from, you know, HR, whoever, and, and it's a collection of all of those physician reviews throughout the month. And she has such anxiety over that because it's because so much important, so much extrinsic importance has been placed on you must get five stars each time. Yeah. Well, she works with patients with dementia and <laughs> they're, you know, psychosis. And, and so it can be, you know, the most random thing will, will give her a low score. And that's, that's such a huge blow. Yeah. Um, so finding that, that balance as well, because I love what you're talking about, because people look forward to that. Um, 
It's not a negative. It's a positive. It's kind of like what Duncan is talking about here, right? With with training, with sexual harassment training, right? It's a it's a negative, right? You will, Mm -hmm. right? You bad people. You need to do these things and shape up. It's like, you know, you're just assuming I'm guilty. Um, And yeah, that's not the right way to approach it for sure. Um, Yeah, the big shift that we, you know, on the sexual harassment topic, the big shift that we found was instead of looking at it from this legalese mm -hmm. element. and this accusatory point of view, because what we found was that the, you know, uh, the most egregious offenders, you know, which is usually men within power or management position, went into these trainings with a feeling that they were already guilty of something. And we were like, and that's not an, that's not a position that I, that they will be receptive to anything. So how do I, going back to the environment, how do I write out of the canon, create an environment that feels welcoming and not accusatory. So we we shifted the conversation to bystander intervention. So instead of just talking about the legal aspects of Title IX and repercussions, we said, well, you know, how do we create that sense of relatedness, right, within the team? Because the vast majority of people are not harassers. They are the minority. Yeah. So we're saying, well, okay, well, we know that 98% of our team are going to be the good guys. So how do you speak up when you witness something that's inappropriate. Now you're an ally. Now you have that connectedness back to your team. You have the autonomy to, you know, create your own intervention strategy, you know, and so that was, so we wanted to shift that because egregious sexual harassment offenders, there's no training in the world that's going to fix that. They, they, yeah. They just need to go. <laughs> I, can't well, with, I mean, we're seeing this play out in real time with the former governor of New York, right? So from, from what I've seen from his testimony so far, and I haven't seen a whole lot, is what I'm picking up from that, Austin, is that he doesn't really think he did anything wrong. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, well no, I, these are women that work, and I asked him out, what, what? <laughs> you know? And yeah, he doesn't see the problem, right? So there's a huge disconnect there. Yes. Um, so really, and, and I definitely want to jump into our main topic here, which is the challenge that people are seeing right now is what do you want to get, right? And our topic today was food safety culture, right? We're all seeing out there that we want food safety culture, right? We want a safe workplace. We don't want to be sexually harassed, type of things, right? Mm-hmm. And the big thing that's on everybody's mind is, okay, everybody's talking about food safety culture. Everybody's writing it into their quality standards. Everybody's writing it into, you know, all kinds of different, you know, FDA's talking about it. It's out there big time. And people are going, okay, great. How? How do we do this? And I, I think, Austin, there's a big fear. And I, I think this big fear is relative to, who does it, right? Because if I'm a quality manager and I'm working in a plant and I'm reading through the requirements for management commitment and food safety culture, and I'm going, oh, geez, you know, I got, I got to do something about this. The fear is that it becomes yours, right? So now all of a sudden you're the, you're the poor quality manager in the plant and you say, like, hey guys, we need to build a food safety culture. And everybody goes, great, well, go ahead and let us know how that goes. <laughs> And yeah. the guys like, you know, the quality manager is going, I, I, I don't, you know, I have my job. I, you know, I don't have time to do this, right? This mm-hmm. is not fair. And so part of that then is, is there's a hesitancy, even though we know that's the right thing to do, there's a hesitancy to take it on because it's too big of a burden for one person. It is too big of a burden for one person. And I think that's where <clears throat> so much of the, you know, best practices around that is to, to create a coalition, to create a team of people. Because first of all, you know, the, the work that I've been doing with, you know, some of the companies I've worked with around developing food safety culture education programs is around how do we ensure that everybody understands what this is and specifically understands their role. And I can't tell you what your role is, right? If I'm, if I'm the, if I'm in quality, you know, more than likely, I don't understand totally what happens in mergers and acquisitions or in finance or in HR or sales. Um, so creating that coalition that brings all of those different um, silos together, right? And it starts to de-silo the organization and have a representative from each of those departments and say, okay, well, what are potential risks that you personally um, could prevent for, for foods, you know, when it comes to food safety, you know, we see very often sales needs a new product. And so it's like, so the, so the carrot leading the horse is we need a new product ASAP that we can get out to market 
um, so that I can meet my sales figures. And then that is now driving R and D. And then, and so now decisions are being made based off of that specific goal, that results, right? So going back to the element of what do we want to see happen in the organization? If we're all rallied around safe food, first and foremost, that is, you know, and then developing KPIs around how we're going to make that happen. Well, now we can start to say, okay, well, we have this coalition of people and each one of them is responsible for, you know, you know, being a representative of their, of their department and the role that they play within food safety culture. Right. No, I'm, oh, yeah. you're making my head hurt, Austin, because you're bringing back very painful memories for me. <laughs> um, because exactly what you're saying is true, right? So I ran quality of big companies and the sales force would go out and meet with retailers and retailers have certain points in the year where they reset their shelves. And that's when new products get introduced. That's the deadline. And the sales guys will go into the retailer and say, okay, hey, we want some more business with you. And the retailer says, okay, fine. We want five new SKUs of gluten-free, whatever. And you need to have that on our shelves in three months. And the sales guys, of course, they're sales guys, right? They're going to say, you got it. We can do that for you. And then they go back to the organization and push that through. And corners are cut and things are missed and risk increases dramatically. And it's hidden, right? Nobody sees it. And from the senior executive level, they think that things are running smoothly because part of the viewpoint at that level is, okay, if things are working, it's all good. I got other stuff to worry about, right? And if, if I push the organization and we make that happen, that, that becomes the new standard. And things can degrade and to the point then where, where a catastrophic food safety event happens. So to reiterate the point then of if, if you're a lone wolf who's trying to do this, you're going to fail, right? So if, I, if I'm in quality and I go to the procurement team and I say, hey, you procurement people, you need to worry about food safety and you need to think about these things. And I walk away, they're mm -hmm. going to go, who the hell is he? Who mm -hmm. does he think he is? He's not my boss. He doesn't tell me how to do my job. That's my boss over there. He tells me what to do. And my job is to buy stuff as cheaply and efficiently as possible. And that's what I get my raise and my bonus on. <sighs> He can worry about food safety himself, right? <laughs> yep. you, you're going to fail. You are going to fail. It has to come from the top. And so the example we were talking about, which I think is a really good one, is recalls. So food safety culture, right? We don't want recalls. And every year, the recalls, the number of recalls keeps going up. And everybody's going, oh, my God, why are recalls going up? And I, I think, Austin, a lot of it comes down to there's just an assumption in an organization that things are going to continue with the way they continue and they're not proactively working to go to zero recalls. And then something happened and everybody's like, oh, my God, why did that happen? Right. And there's all these little pieces in there that make that happen. So you need that senior leadership level. And the example we were talking about is the CEO comes out just like the example with Alcoa you were talking about. Mm -hmm. OK, organization, here's our goal for the year. We will have zero food safety recalls in 2022. Zero, none, intolerable. If something is going on food safety related, I want you to call me. Right? I want to know about it. And then he pushes that out, that senior executive pushes it out to their team. And the CEO, she goes around and says, okay, heads of procurement, operations, quality, R&D, legal, everybody. Food safety is now in your goals. And we will yep. have zero recalls in 2022. And you will be judged against that. Right. You now have an objective around that and that gets pushed down to the organization. And now everybody can look at that and say, oh, gosh, OK, well, as a team, how do we address that? OK, sales guys, you need to be considering when you're going out food safety. Right. You just can't arbitrarily accept things. Right. You need to bring that back for a discussion. R&D, when you're developing new products, you can't be introducing new allergens in the plant without really, really investigating that first, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can then look at that information and say, OK, how can we build that and then buy, buy that down within the organization? And really, I think this gets into where your company and your genius relative to this Austin is super important because this now then shows us the way forward with new tools. Mm -hmm. And we can start building out a story at corporate. Right Now, imagine everybody, close your eyes and think about this. There's a training video people at corporate are watching. And it's going through a story of how not to launch new products, right? Where the sales guys go out and they make unrealistic promises and the R&D guys cut corners and the procurement buys from some people they really don't know very well, but they've got that one ingredient that you need for this new product. 
and the QA guys get the information and they give it to the plants and they're really not sure how they're going to control it in the food safety plan. And we don't know how to clean the equipment, right? Everything cascades and you have a recall, right? And everyone then can see there, there's, there's no one, there's no bad guy in this scenario. It's, yep. it's a series of steps and actions that take place that cascade into a failure, right? Now think of the opposite side of that, right? Where you have a system in place that's managing at the corporate side, these food safety issues. And then you're able to bring this down to the plant and train appropriately for these new things. Now, when an auditor comes into a company and says, explain to me your food safety culture, everybody in all these different groups and all these different people that we're talking about in this process can talk about, we have a goal in our company of zero recalls. We totally understand that what we do here impacts people's families, people's children and their lives. And here's the things that we do in these different departments to meet those requirements. Here's what I do in procurement to make sure product is safe. Here's what I do in legal to make sure product is safe. Here's what I do in the plant on the production line. Mm -hmm. Now that auditor goes and wanes and says, that's food safety culture. Exactly. And, and, and ex what you just talked about was almost a <laughs> exact mirror of the, the film that we created for Hershey, which was, you know, here's a company that, is continually expanding their portfolio and they have a great track record of having a, a really strong food safety culture, low recalls. And they said, well, we want to, as we expand, we know that we need to stay in front of this. And so we created this, you know, learning film for them that did that exact thing. We, we created a narrative around a company that saw market opportunity and they wanted to jump on it and, they moved too quickly and launched a product, but it, t it tied in every element you talked about. It was, <clears throat> you know, sales over promising. It was procurement. You know, there was machinery bought that was modified. The cleaning, you know, the cleaning wasn't changed on it. Um, you know, marketing, you know, the mislabeling issues. I mean, it was just like everything that could possibly go wrong. We, we kind of included in that story, but it creates that opportunity because here's the other thing that's awesome about creating these analogous narratives is that as viewers, we like to watch the story and tell people how they're doing it wrong. Right. This is the fascination with horror films. When someone's <laughs> walking into that that room and you're like, don't do it. What is wrong with you? But we still watch them. That's I mean, it's one of the most popular film genres out there because we we like to analyze other people's bad decisions and then learn from that. And so, you know, in creating this narrative around this fictitious company, you know, A, it separated out my client from being potentially, you know, associated with this, but also it created an environment where the, the learner is able to watch and be like, oh, God, that would never happen here. And let me tell you why, because we do this, this, this and this. Or I never thought of that before. What can I do to make sure that we don't have that issue? You know, um, so, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to watch people's reactions because you, you see the, the lights going off and. You know, there was another thing you were talking about, and we use the phrase corporate mythology. Like we're trying to create new mythology because historically we use myths and, and myth structure to convey complex knowledge or information of the world that is hard to grasp, right? If I don't understand where lightning comes from, then, then we create a myth around that. Well, it's the same thing. We're trying to create corporate mythology that explains here is why we do what we do. And, and how we communicate that culture. And it comes through this like common mythology that we can all share this narrative. Um, so that's that's a lot of what we're trying to do is create that narrative that that everybody can kind of rally around and have that you know common enemy, which is recalls. Yeah. And yeah, one of the stats I, I love to pound into people's heads relative to recalls, Austin, is the average cost, just the average direct cost of a recall is $30 million. Mm -hmm. How much product do you have to make and sell to make up for that loss, right? If you're at a 10% margin, that's $300 million in product to make up for that failure if your company survives, right? Right. And part of what we're talking about here too, people may be thinking, yeah, okay, this is all well and good for big companies, but you know, we're, we're kind of a little guy. What about us? Well, Everything we're talking about here, all these different handoffs and all these different functions, every company needs these. And the time to build them is when you're smaller, right? Because as you get larger, these things get entrenched on how you do things. 
and mergers and acquisitions happen and new people come on board and you have to teach them how you do things. And the bigger you get, the harder that gets to change. So you know, there's a saying, you, know, you either you create the culture or the culture will create you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're going to have a culture, whether you like it or not, you better choose it. Definitely. Yeah. And starting earlier is, is definitely key because yeah, I mean, coming in and, and trying to change course on a multi-billion dollar ship, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a, that's a massive task right. um, as opposed to just starting with the simple thing of we're about zero recalls and then building on that. Yeah. And it's a nice, simple message that everybody can understand. And you, you, had, you had mentioned one of these areas where you can apply these type of things earlier that I think is worth reemphasizing, which is mergers and acquisitions, right? Mm -hmm. So at the senior executive level within companies, a lot of times the, the senior leadership, so the CEO, for example, doesn't come from operations. They come from finance or marketing or sales or something like this, or they come completely from a different industry. So they have that skill set. And they worked in automotive and now all of a sudden they're running a food company. Mm -hmm. right? they, they, they have no idea, right? So they have to be taught these things as well. And when you're looking at mergers and acquisitions, a lot of time these things aren't looked at. You, you will look at what they understand. They will set up, you know, if you're looking at buying a company, you know, they will set up a special room with the financial information and all these type of stuff so that the company who's interested in buying the other company can go in and look at this stuff. And it's almost always just financial things. Mm -hmm. Who's looking at the food safety things? Who is going to the plants and saying, okay, does this company have a good food safety culture? Do they understand how to control allergens? Do they understand design control? Do they have change management? Because those are all risks and those should be taken into consideration for the M&A process. So if based upon the numbers in the books, which are always, you know, they always make them look pretty. Right? Mm -hmm. If you value that company at $100 million, but then your food safety evaluation and their culture, you go and look at these things and you find risk, it may take $10 million to fix those things. So you go back with a counter offer and say, hey, listen, you know, we still want to buy your company, but based upon what we found, we're adjusting our offer down to make up for those things so that we can fix those. So yeah, you may think it's worth hundred million, but we found it's worth closer to 90 for mm -hmm. us, right? And then those surprises are brought to the surface. Plus, you're also teaching people how to look at those things, which is super valuable. Right. Yeah. And I, I struggle to understand why they don't do that already. I'm like, if it, if it, if it gives you that bargaining chip to, to lower the price based on findings, I, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. And like you said, maybe it's because there's the rush. You know, it's like we need this we need this ingredient now. And so we're kind of we're willing to overpay for it and just get things going. Um, yeah as opposed to nitpicking over price. I don't know. Uh, I'm not an M&A guy. Exactly. And, and uh, so some companies are, are better at that. Um, yeah. David makes a point here that he's known a few heads of food safety have resigned because there was there was no food safety due diligence before an acquisition. Yeah. I mean, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, it's a bad situation to be in. So as usual, Austin, time is flying. So let's 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 kind of bring this up because I, I think this has been an exceptionally important food safety chat because it's it's giving people ideas around how to move forward with these these topics. And we all understand that we want to implement a food safety culture, but if you try and do it yourself, you're gonna fail, right? This has to be an organizational activity. So there was three main buckets of things that we talked about, guys, and, and please jump in here, Austin, to help me summarize these, which is, you know, how is learning designed? What is the, your outcome? What are you measuring? Right. Zero recalls. We will have zero food safety recalls in 2022. Man, is that easy to understand? Right. People understand that goal. How do you measure these things? What is the ROI and how do you measure these things? Why? Why are people learning? Not how do people learn, but why are they learning? What type of motivations can you give to people to want them to learn in these environments? And then what do you want to get? And how do you avoid that big fear? And, and Helen reemphasized the point that I made earlier, which is that pain around, you know, the QA manager and being afraid that, you know, they see what needs to be done, but they need help, right? And they're afraid if they raise their hand, it's all going to be dumped on their shoulders. And if they fail, they'll get blamed for it. So people hesitate when you have that fear. So putting together that committee and working and getting this from senior leadership, right? It has to be the senior leadership in the company that says, this is a goal for everyone. 
right? This is non-negotiable. If you want to, if you want to be part of this organization, you have to support this. That needs to be communicated often. Is, is that a good summary so far? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, and, and the, you know, the element of starting at the, at the top is, is critical. You know, we, we just rolled out a pretty large scale food safety culture kind of education program. And, you know, we, we started with the CEO um, and, you know, facilitated the course with him and then started with, you know, all of the regional CEOs and COOs um, so that everybody was on the same page of, and, and that they, they made specific commitments to like how they are going to improve food safety culture within their region and their department and, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, because that's the other thing is, is seeing leadership, you know, walk the walk, um, that, 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 that there is specific commitments coming from leadership as well, I think yeah. is critical. Um, because then it's like, I'm, well, people are more likely to mirror that behavior if they see that there's a full commitment. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Joe made a good point here, right? Um, food safety professionals are amazing and can do this and don't do it alone, right? And so I think this is where, and it, it's kind of a unique quirk of human psychology, Austin, maybe you have some comments on this as well, is that sometimes outside authority is a major help, right? If you have someone who understands this topic inside and out, like yourself, who can come into an organization and say, here's the things that you need to do. And what this person has been telling you, I completely agree with that type of uh, external support from authority is uh, huge, right? It, it helps to validate that messaging. And so that's where, you know, consulting groups like EAS Consulting and the experts that they have in these areas and companies like Sage Media are super valuable, right? Because they can come in and shave years off of what you're doing, right? Because if you're trying to do all this on your own, it's very, very difficult get the help you need and accelerate that process and, and you'll win, right? There's a, you yeah. win. We're, we're actually working with a hospital group right now on doing some onboarding because they, they have a very high turnover rate and they realized that there were some cultural issues within how they were onboarding people. And this is a problem they've been working on internally for two and a half, three years. And we came in and it was like, we can, we can have this done in four months, like, <laughs> because it's going to be the only thing we're focused on. Like, yeah. you're not, you know, no more committees, no more bureaucracy. Like we're, we're going to get this done um, because they were bleeding money. I mean, it was, they quantified it was costing them over 120 million a year Oof. in just losing people, you know, but before, you know, so it's like, okay, our KPI now is retention. And if we can, if we know that we're losing people at the 90 day mark, you know, if I can double that and keep them for six months, then we've just lowered that, turnover costs dramatically. Yep, absolutely. And yeah, so part of this, right, and this is why you're here on the food safety chat. And so with that, thank you for attending, right? You're growing your knowledge, you're getting new perspectives and new expertise. And I applaud you for doing that on a Friday morning. Um, so thank you for being here. And hopefully today's message, you know, from my viewpoint, this is exceptionally important information. Um, and I always enjoy having Austin on because, you know, he just, Every time he, he blows my mind with the information he has. Um, so Martin had a comment here. Uh, part of the responsibilities of the QA manager, promote quality and food safety, measure to improve, document, and validate, but also to be an extrovert, to be a leader, a communicator, a companion, and to lead by example. Coworkers and management will follow his or her leadership. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, so part of what I, what I preach as well is that a lot of times in technical fields, we think that technical skills are all that matters and that people will see that we're doing and they'll just automatically join in. No, absolutely <laughs> not, right? You need to have the skill set to promote and show others the correct path, right? If, if you are the quality manager and everything that we're saying here makes sense to you and you don't push that up through the organization and try and promote that within those other groups, you're going to have a really hard time. Right. So hopefully everybody understands that. Um, uh, always good to see Robert here. Our friend, Robert Prevendar. Good to see you. And Corey, of course. Um, Thanks, Corey. What, what, one other quick note here as well is earlier here. And Renee, if you can post this again, I would appreciate it. Uh, I put together a locals group and locals is a free platform. You can sign up and get notifications from me on what's going on in recalls. Uh, some snarky comments from me on recalls every now and then. So for example, one of the things I always harp on is foreign material recalls. Um, 
More than half of recalls now, Austin, are for non-metal items. So plastic and other stuff, right? What are you doing to bring those numbers down, right? What can you then take from what we're learning today and apply to training in those areas for foreign material, right? There's all kinds of applications for this information. So please uh, join the locals group. It's free. Uh, there's a membership side where there's additional information and live streams and other stuff from me too, which is kind of cool. So you can get that benefit as well. And of course, the live stream is every Friday and we do this at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Eastern. And so for some of our friends around the world, so there was a gentleman here I saw earlier from India. So thank you for joining us, right? So middle of the night for them. Um, we do this every Friday. And so we will be back here next Friday, December 10th with another topic. And thank you, everybody. I mean, your, your involvement and commitment and comments on this make this worthwhile and make this fun for us. So thank you for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks, man. Everybody, uh, enjoy your weekend. Uh, this was a great food safety chat. Um, tons of good material in here. So uh, if you want more information from us, you have our emails on here. So I'm on here, brmantrout at foodleadershipgroup.com and austin at sage.media. So thanks again, everybody, and enjoy your weekend. And thank you, Austin. Always an awesome pleasure to have you on, my friend. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody.